Thank you so much, Scott, and thanks to all of you for coming to be here today. Um, as Scott mentioned, my name is Scott Greenberg, and I'm a senior analyst at the Tax Foundation. Um, and welcome on behalf of all of us to Tax Foundation University. Now, in previous years, we've started out Tax Foundation University with sort of a big picture theoretical presentation of what the economics of tax policy look like, uh, of the field of tax economics. Uh, but today we're going to try something a little bit different. And actually, rather than starting from the broad and the general, we're going to start from the specific. And we're specifically going to look at the bill that Congress passed and President Trump signed last December, the bill known as the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act. And we're going to use that as sort of an opening to discuss how tax policy affects the economy and how this specific piece of legislation according to sort of our best estimates and guesses, is going to be affecting the US economy in the years to come. So we're going to ask today, I think, four big questions um, and, and try to answer those in the course of this lecture. Our first question um, is, is very simple. What, what did the legislation do? Uh, there's been, I think, a lot of rhetoric about the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act. You listen to one side of things, you'll think that it's near apocalyptic that it's going to unravel the US, social the US social contract, that it's going to place a huge burden on the backs of the middle class. You listen to another piece of rhetoric, you hear that it's going to create an unprecedented economic boom, inaugurate a new American renaissance. Um, we're going to try and stay away from some of that rhetoric today and instead discuss the actual details of what this legislation contained. Uh, that's, that's our first big question on the docket. Um, our second question is, why, why might we expect a big tax bill to have an economic effect at all? What, what are the channels or, or the mechanisms by which a bill like this might affect the US economy? Uh, what, what are the pathways by which that might happen? That's, that's the second question we're going to talk about. Our third question is, when people have actually looked at the legislation in question, when people have examined the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act, uh, what do they think is going to happen? What, what do they think the effects are going to be? And we, we have estimated uh, the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act's economic effects. A number of other organizations have done so as well. And we'll talk a little bit about what are those estimates, where do they come from, um, what do they mean for uh, understanding the practical effects of, of this, legislati this legislation that passed last December. And our last question is going to be, how does all this tie into federal revenue? How do the economic effects of tax policies then go on to affect the amount of revenue that the federal government collects? Uh, so that's, that's what's on the docket for today. And we'll, I think, begin with our first question, which is what did the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act do? And broadly speaking, I think it's pretty clear that the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act did two big things. And those big things are what we might call tax cuts and tax reform. And it's probably useful for us to distinguish between these two things because they sometimes get conflated when we're talking about tax policy. Broadly speaking, tax cuts refers to changing the level of federal revenue or how much revenue does the federal government collect. Meanwhile, tax reform refers to changing the structure of the federal tax code, or how does the federal government raise the revenue that it's raising. Tax cuts are about how much. Tax reform is about how do we do it. And there were elements of both tax cuts and tax reform in the legislation passed last December. The legislation was very clearly a tax cut. Before the legislation passed, the Congressional Budget Office estimated that the US was going to be collecting about 18.2% of the size of the economy as federal revenue. After the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act passed, that number dropped from 18.2% to 17.5% of the US economy that the federal government collects in revenue. So the bill was very clearly a tax cut. At the same time, the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act was also very clearly a tax reform. It made a lot of very significant changes to how the US government raises all of the revenue that it raises. 
into how the tax system works and how households and businesses compute how much tax they owe to the federal government. Broadly speaking, the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act included three big categories of provisions. And each of these categories have elements of both tax cuts and tax reform in them. Our three categories are individual tax changes, business tax changes, and international tax changes. And we're going to walk through a couple of these provisions uh, right now to sort of get a sense of some of the major elements of the bill. Um, of course, the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act was over 400 pages long. So this right here is only a summary of what we think some of the real major provisions in the legislation is. Starting off with the individual tax changes, um, the individual income tax is the single biggest source of revenue for the federal government. The individual income tax raises, about, ra raises over 40% of everything that the government collects every year. And the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act made a number of very significant changes to that tax in particular, which is the tax that I think is most visible to, to many households who, who are filing taxes every April. First big change, um, it lowered individual tax rates across the board. Used to be that we had seven tax rates that ranged from 10% to 39.6%. Now we've got seven tax rates that range from 10% to 37%. And some of the rates in between got lowered by quite a bit. Uh, the old 15% tax bracket, which was where I think almost the majority of tax paying Americans fell, that tax bracket has now been lowered to 12%, and so on with many of the other rates that the individual income tax is levied at. These rate cuts have two broad effects. Number one, they lower taxes for American families, and therefore they lower the amount of revenue that the federal government is collecting. The second effect of these rate cuts is that they lower taxes on every additional dollar of income that people are making. So if a household makes an additional dollar from, from labor, from working, uh, under the previous tax code, it would pay almost 40 cents on that dollar in taxes to the federal government. Now that's going to be more like 37 cents. Um, those are sort of the big effects of the individual rate cuts that were in the bill. There were also a number of changes to parts of the individual income tax that don't involve rates to all of the deductions and the credits and the exclusions and the other provisions in the tax code that, um, that, that guide how families calculate how much tax they owe. For instance, there were two large tax benefits for the middle class that were expanded under this bill. The first one of these was the standard deduction. You'll see that in the second bullet point. And the standard deduction refers to how much of your income is subject to no tax whatsoever. Um, that was almost doubled by the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act. Another big provision that was expanded was the child tax credit, which is a provision that benefits households with children. Um, on the flip side, there were also some provisions in the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act that cut back on deductions and credits and so forth that made those provisions smaller and perhaps less distortive for the economy. So we had the elimination of a provision known as the personal exemption. We had new caps on itemized deductions. Um, these are deductions largely taken by upper middle class households and high income households. We're talking here like the mortgage interest deduction, the deduction for state and local taxes paid, the charitable deduction. Um, the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act included new rules for each of these deductions. And in many cases, these were new limits, limits on how much mortgage interest people could be deducting, limits on how much state and local taxes people could be deducting. The overall effect of all of these provisions on the individual side was to make the individual tax base broader. Now, what, what do we mean by tax base? Um, in order to, for the federal government to figure out how much revenue it's raising from a tax, it needs to know what its tax rates are, but it also needs to know how much income those rates are applying to. Now, in 2015, 
uh, there was about 17, 16 trillion dollars of income in the United States. But the majority of that income wasn't actually subject to federal income tax. In fact, taxable income was about $7.5 trillion in that year. And that refers to, th that's the tax base. That's how much income the federal government is actually able to tax. So what happened on the individual side was that the tax rates on households went down across the board, but a number of other changes made it so that the tax base, the amount of income that was subject to taxation, actually grew a little bit under the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act, uh, certainly for many households, which means that even though these individual changes will lead to pretty significant revenue losses, a lot of the reforms that were made to the individual income tax code will limit those revenue losses, will make the tax base broader, and will sort of, will cut back on some of these deductions and exclusions which might have distorted different decisions that households were making. Um, that's sort of your big picture summary of what was going on with the individual income tax. And on the bottom you'll see a couple more bullet points. Um, one particularly notable one uh, was that there was, there, there was a fairly large estate tax cut that was included in the bill. Um, the estate tax is a tax that applies to households uh, when, when they pass away, when they die, um, specifically to the value of their estates. Um, and one, one important provision in the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act was to cut back on how much revenue that tax was raising. So much for the individual components of the bill. Um, the business components of the bill are, I think, arguably even more important in understanding um, the effects of the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act. And the very first one um, that probably all of you are aware of uh, was the corporate rate cut. Um, the corporate income tax is one of several taxes that the federal government levies, and it is a tax on the income of corporations. Um, so not all businesses in the United States, um, but most of the big ones, most of the big household names that you've probably heard of. Um, and previously, the corporate income tax was levied at a rate of 35%, um, which was, um, in fact, the highest statutory corporate tax rate in the entire developed world. And I think the second highest in the entire world after um, the United Arab Emirates, maybe. Um, so by international norms, our corporate income tax rate uh, was among the highest. Uh, one of the central provisions of the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act was lowering that rate very significantly from 35% to 21%. Um, that was um, a pretty significant tax cut in as much as it was lowering how much revenue the federal government is going to collect from the corporate income tax. Uh, but there's also, again, a secondary effect, which is that not only is it changing the amount of taxes that businesses will pay overall, it also affects the amount of taxes that businesses pay when they're considering an additional investment or an additional opportunity for profit. Um, previously, a dollar of corporate profit, an additional dollar would have been taxed 35 cents. Now that additional dollar of corporate profit would be taxed at 21 cents. Um, and as we'll discuss later, it's that change to the tax treatment of additional business decisions that's going to be especially crucial as we try and understand the economic effects of this bill. The corporate tax rate cut was, by, was far from the only significant change to the business tax system though. Our second bullet point uh, is 100% expensing. And this refers to the deductions that businesses get to take when they invest in new things like equipment and machinery and so forth. Um, under our current tax code, um, there's sort of a weird way that businesses measure income. Usually you'd think that when you're figuring out what your income is as a business, you take your revenue, what you collect, you subtract your expenses, what you've spent your money on, and that, that's the measure of your income. In fact, in the tax system, it doesn't always work like that. Sometimes you're not always able to subtract all of your business costs, and specifically, businesses aren't always allowed to subtract the costs of their investments, like their equipment, their machinery, their buildings, their land, their inventory. 
the things that businesses spend money on that produce profits in the future rather than currently. Um, this provision was pretty unique. Uh, to, it was unique uh, to the extent that um, now for equipment and machinery, businesses will be able to subtract the cost of 100% of the amount they spend on those categories um, rather, than, rather than getting a limited deduction. And as we'll discuss later on, that, that's probably going to be a particularly economically significant provision when thinking about the, the effects of uh, the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act. Some of the other provisions listed on here um, are, are, are actually um, tax increases on business, um, which serve to, again, broaden the tax base of the corporate income tax. So for instance, number three here is our limit on the net interest deduction. And that's limiting the amount of interest payments that businesses are able to deduct when they're calculating their income. And the aim of this was more or less to level the playing field between businesses that have lots of debt and businesses that don't have so much debt to make sure that the tax code is being even handed between these two different types of businesses. Um, some of the provisions down near the bottom um, are, are also um, base broadeners. Um, not necessarily good ones, if you ask me, um, but, um, but the, the provisions that are increasing the amount of business income that's subject to federal tax. So too, here in the business section, we've got a combination of rate cuts that, that lower tax rates and base broadeners that increase the amount of income that's in our tax base. Um, of particular note is, is this fifth bullet, bullet point on here, uh, which is a deduction for pass-through businesses. Um, most businesses in the United States aren't corporations uh, and therefore don't see any direct benefit from the corporate rate cut listed near the top. Um, this new deduction for pass-through businesses is meant to help um, those other businesses um, like partnerships and self-employed individuals and so on. Um, it's, it's, it's meant to provide tax relief to those businesses. Um, that provision has sometimes been criticized, though, um, for the way that it was designed. Uh, and some folks are worried that it will be used as a tool for tax avoidance rather than just offering tax relief to business income. So that's sort of your big high-level summary of the business tax changes. The international tax changes we won't spend so much time on today because we've got an entire session relating to those two weeks from now. It'll um, be led by Kyle Pomerlo, who's a colleague of mine, uh, who knows lots and lots about the taxation of multinational companies, uh, which is uh, all of the things that are covered in this right-hand column. But that is your big picture overview of what the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act actually included. And again, um, it's a mixture of both tax cuts provisions that lower federal revenue in general, and tax reforms, provisions that change the way that we raise revenue, that change deductions and exclusions and credits, um, and the other rules for people calculating how much taxes they owe. So that is our overview of the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act. Um, and we'll move on sort of to our second question, which is, how would we go about figuring out the economic effects of such a piece of legislation? And I'll give you a, a brief preview of our results here. Um, this is a chart from the Congressional Budget Office. And this chart compares different estimates of how much the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act is expected to grow the size of the US economy. Here you can see that its effect on the level of real GDP. And GDP is, um, is an acronym. It stands for Gross Domestic Product. And all that means is how much we're producing in the United States. Um, it's, it's a commonly used measure of the size of the US economy. And here on the left-hand side, you can see the list of all the different organizations that have tried their hand at estimating the economic effects of the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act. Um, and you can see what these organizations think the effects are in the first year, in the second year, um, in the third year. Sorry about that. Um, in the 10th year, you can see some averages over here. 
And one thing that you'll notice about almost all of these numbers is that whether it's the Tax Policy Center or the Joint Committee on Taxation or the Congressional Budget Office or my organization, the Tax Foundation, virtually all estimates have concluded that the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act will have a positive effect on the size of the US economy, that it's going to grow the US economy, that um, it's going to lead to more production in the United States. Um, and the, the, the size of the estimates, I, th I think, um, is, is, differs pretty dramatically between different organizations. Some folks think that it's going to be a very small positive effect. Some folks think that it's going to be a medium-sized effect. But all parties, virtually all parties, agree that the effect on the US economy over the next five years is going to be positive. So all this is to motivate our question, wh why would people come to that conclusion? What about the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act leads all of these organizations to say that the legislation will have a positive effect on the amount that the US produces? Uh, and to answer this question, I think we need to take a step back and ask maybe a broader question, which is what causes economic growth? What, what are the determinants of a size of a country's economy? So on this slide, uh, we've got a pretty famous equation in economics, and, and hopefully uh, the, these symbols uh, won't, won't be intimidating to, to anyone. But, but it's actually a pretty simple equation. Um, and we've, we've got sort of a verbal description uh, on the bottom here of what's going on in this equation. And broadly speaking, Economists' general understanding of how the economy works suggests that there are more or less three big things that determine how large an economy is and how much a nation is able to produce. Um, we'll start with number two, actually, which is labeled L. Um, and that's labor. Uh, and that's basically how much people are working. Are people working 40 hour weeks or are they working 30 hour weeks? Are, do we have 4% um, unemployment? Do we have 6% unemployment? Do we have most people um, in, their, in the prime age range working? Or are a lot of folks between 25 and 65 not in the labor force? All of those questions are questions about labor. How much people are working? And that's one of the three major elements of how much an economy can produce, is how, much, how many people are going to work every day. But of course, people working all by themselves can't make very much. Um, a farmer who doesn't have any equipment, or a manufacturer that doesn't have a factory, uh, or a ditch digger that doesn't have a shovel, isn't going to be able to produce very much. And that leads us to the second big thing that determines how much an economy is, what, what the size of an economy is. And that second big thing is capital. And capital refers to all those things we were talking about, machines and equipments and factories and buildings, um, all the things that take your work and turn it into something more productive, something that's able to create real value for people. That's the second big element of what determines the size of an economy. And our third big element over here uh, is what's known as total factor productivity. Um, and when you see that phrase, total factor productivity, in your heads you should be thinking everything else. Um, this is sort of where economists do a little hand wavy thing and say, well, there must be some other factors that affect, that affect how efficiently you can combine your labor with your capital to make stuff that people value. And there are a lot of different things that fall into this category of total factor productivity. So one thing is technology or innovation. Uh, if you handed an industrial-sized tractor uh, to someone in Mesopotamia in 1000 BC, well, they'd have the labor, they'd have the capital, but they might not have the know-how to use the tractor. That third part is the technology, uh, is the innovation that lets people combine their labor and their capital in a way that's economically useful. That's one part of total factor productivity. Another part uh, is uh, institutions. Um, right? we, we often talk about 
whether people are certain or uncertain, uh, the state of property rights, et cetera. Um, all of those affect um, how we can combine labor and capital in order to make things. So to sum up, these are sort of the three big ingredients of what determines the size of the economy. And we've got a question in the back. Yes. Uh, that's a great question. Um, certain, uh, you're, you're right to point out that these definitions are sort of fluid. Um, so for instance, let's say that um, a major movie studio uh, develops a really beloved superhero. Um, that, that superhero um, is in some sense a capital product. Um, it's a thing that lets the company's designers and their actors provide value to people because of the idea of Superman or something. It's also sort of a piece of technology um, in, in, the, in, the, in the sense that it was, it was the result of innovation and creativity. Um, you're right to point out that these categories are a little bit fluid with each other and aren't always easily distinguished. So now that we've answered this big question about what determines the size of the economy, the obvious next question to ask is, how does tax policy affect each of these three things? How does it affect labor? How does it affect capital? How does it affect total factor productivity? Well, the third question um, we can answer, I think, pretty simply, which is, we're not entirely sure how tax policy affects total factor productivity, how it affects innovation, how it affects institutions, how it affects some of the other big things that determine the size of the economy. We've got some guesses, but it's sort of hard to measure. The two parts of this equation that we do have a better idea about how tax policy affects are labor and capital. And specifically, we have got a lot of research showing that the amount that you tax people on their work and the amount that you tax people on their investment does have a real effect on how much people work and how much people invest. Um, for instance, it's a, it, it's, it's a well-known finding that if you tax an additional hour of work um, at 20%, um, you're typically, on average, going to get people who are working more than if you tax that additional hour of work at 60%. Um, many studies have shown that people's labor decisions are responsive to how much they're being taxed on an additional hour of labor. We've also had studies that have shown that investment is responsive to tax policy, indeed probably more responsive than labor is. Um, we, we, we have very good evidence that as the effect of the tax system on profits by businesses changes, businesses will change their investment decisions. So when tax policy lowers the tax burden on an additional investment, and that investment becomes more profitable, businesses are more likely to make that additional investment, to build an additional factory, to build an additional machine, to build an additional piece of equipment. Um, on the next slide here, um, I've, I've listed actually a couple of recent studies in the last 12 years that have hammered home this point about how important the tax system is for business decision making specifically. We have evidence that um, the corporate tax rate, for instance, is one really important ingredient when businesses are deciding how much capital to put in the United States. That's our first bullet point here. We have very extensive evidence that the ability of businesses to deduct their capital investments, uh, which was related to the 100% expensing provision we were talking about earlier, we've got pr very good evidence that that is something that uh, helps businesses determine how much they're going to invest. Uh, we've got evidence from across the world. Um, we've got evidence on foreign investment. Um, the, the bulk of the studies that have been done strongly suggest that businesses' investment decisions are responsive to the amount that we tax businesses and specifically the amount that we tax businesses' additional investments. So 
to answer our initial question, why would we think that a piece of legislation like the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act might have an economic effect? The basic answer is because it does affect the taxation of labor and the taxation of capital. The several provisions of the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act lower taxation of additional hours worked, such as the individual rate cuts, which lower individual income taxes across the board. Similarly, there are several provisions of the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act that affect, that affect taxation of business investments. The lower corporate rate, the 100% expensing of new investments. Now, not all of the provisions of the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act have a positive economic effect. Um, this, this is important to, to recognize. Just as the legislation was a mix of tax cuts and tax increases, it's also a mix of some provisions with positive economic effects and some with negative economic effects. Some of the provisions are going to, on the margin, discourage additional work or discourage additional investment. But every organization that has looked at the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act has determined that, on balance, the legislation creates a greater incentive for people to work, thus leading to more labor, and a greater incentive for people to make investments, leading to greater capital formation. And that is the broad explanation of why you're seeing these figures um, from all of these different organizations that really couldn't be more different from one another. Now, the effects of the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act are not going to be the same every year. Um, and this is, this is an important point, because if we go back to this slide, um, which lists the details of the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act, there's one word that you're going to see here over and over and over again, and that word is temporary. Um, how many times do we have it on here? At least, at least seven. Um, and that's because many pieces of the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act were not passed into permanent law. They were enacted for four years, for five years, for eight years. Um, and that has to do broadly um, as, as a political matter with the particular legislative vehicle that Congress chose uh, for passing the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act, uh, which, which was reconciliation, which has some limits on what you can do in terms of permanent policy. So what all of that means is that virtually everyone who's looked at the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act thinks that it's going to have a larger effect on the economy in the short term than it will in the long term. And that's because, in part, of all of these provisions that are going to be expiring after 2021, 2022, 2025. So for instance, 100% expensing. Um, which is probably going to be one of the keys to the economic effects of the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act, is only in place for five years. After 2022, um, the provision is set to phase out until it expires entirely after 2026. Similarly, many of these individual provisions are only going to be around as passed in the legislation for eight years unless Congress chooses to extend them or make them permanent. Um, and as a result, um, most of the economic forecasts think that the positive effects of the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act are going to get smaller over time. Again, remain positive, but smaller over time. I'll show you here the Tax Foundation's estimates. Um, this is, um, in the light blue, how much GDP growth uh, would have been expected uh, had the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act not passed. Um, and the dark blue is how much growth of the U.S. economy we, the Tax Foundation expects as a result of the passage of the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act. And you'll see that the dark blue line is higher than the light blue line for the first eight years of the legislation, which is another way of saying the Tax Foundation estimates that the legislation is going to create more economic growth than otherwise would have occurred. But then after eight years, a funny thing happens. Um, the rate of GDP growth from the legislation is actually a little bit lower than it otherwise would have been, which is another way of saying that some of the positive effects from the first eight years 
we expect to diminish in size to the extent that the temporary provisions in the legislation are allowed to expire. And that, I think, is a pretty key part of understanding the economics of the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act. Yes? This slide over here? Ah. Yeah. That's a really great question. So to repeat the question for those who might not have heard it, the, given that there is this uncertainty about how exactly Congress will handle the expiring provisions of the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act, how are any of these organizations here able to predict what's going to happen to the economy after 2025? Or even after 2021 when the first round of provisions start expiring? Um, and the answer to your question is that I believe that every organization here assumes that the law as written will take place. That all of the expirations that were written into the law will take place and that those changes will occur. Um, which is why everyone's estimated that, which is one reason why everyone's estimated that the long run growth is probably going to be lower than the short run growth. Um, if Congress does choose to make some of these provisions permanent, then one would probably expect these organizations to come back and say, well, if, if, if such a permanence bill passes, we're going to update our estimates, our estimates higher to account for the fact that fewer of these provisions are temporary and more of them are permanent. D does that answer your question? Great, so to summarize um, what we've discussed, um, the reason why the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act is expected by all accounts to grow the US economy, or we'll say the main reason, um, is because it lowers taxes on additional labor and it lowers taxes on additional capital investment. And that those changes are likely to lead people to work more and to lead businesses to invest more, at least for the periods in which those changes are going to be in effect in law. Great. Um, well, now I think turn to the very last part um, of our discussion today, which is what will all of this mean for federal revenue? Um, now, you, some of you who, who work here on the Hill have probably uh, heard the terms static and dynamic uh, before when talking about how to estimate the revenue effects of different pieces of federal legislation. Uh, and the reason why um, that's a conversation is because of this chart over here. Um, this chart over here is, is a chart I made the other day. Um, and it compares um, how federal revenue varies with the size of the economy. In blue is each year's change in federal revenue. In orange is each year's change in the size of the economy. And what you'll notice is that by and large, these two lines move in concert with one another. Um, in general, when the economy gets bigger, federal revenue tends to go up. And when the economy gets smaller, federal revenue tends to go down. And this makes a lot of sense. Um, after all, um, if our biggest revenue raiser is an income tax, uh, when the economy gets bigger, people have more income, they pay more taxes on that income, uh, federal revenue gets bigger as well. So this is a pretty well-documented correspondence between the size of the economy and between federal revenue. As a result, if you've got a piece of legislation like the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act that's expected on all counts to change the size of the US economy, we'd also probably expect that to have some effects on federal revenue. Now, this is referred to uh, by those of us who work in tax economics as the difference between a static score and a dynamic score. A static score considers how much revenue loss we would see from a tax change 
if people's behavior stayed the same, if the economy stayed the same size that is, as it is right now. Whereas a dynamic score takes into account how, how people change their decisions in responses to tax policy and how the economy might respond to tax policy. So here on this next slide, we've got some estimates from the Joint Committee on Taxation. Uh, for those of you who aren't familiar, the Joint Committee on Taxation is sort of the sister organization to the CBO, except rather than dealing with the entire budget, the Joint Committee on Taxation deals with taxes. And you can see the Joint Committee on Taxation's estimates for how much the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act will affect re federal revenue. So you can see that on a static basis, the JCT thinks that over a 10-year period, the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act is going to reduce federal revenue by about $1.5 trillion. Let's give some context to that number. Uh, between 2018 and 2027, um, the CBO projected last year that the federal government was going to raise about $43 trillion. Um, so what JCT is saying here is that instead of $43 trillion, it estimated that that number would fall to about $41.5 trillion, or b that federal revenue would fall by $1.5 trillion. But that estimate is the JCT's static estimate. That's before taking into account how the size of the economy might respond to the change in tax policy. And here you see the JCT's, the second part of their estimate, um, which is additional revenue resulting from macroeconomic analysis. That's the second line here. And macroeconomic analysis is just a fancy word, a fancy term for how much the size of the economy is going to change. And what the JCT concluded in their study uh, was an additional $384 billion of federal revenue due to the fact that the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act would make the economy larger. Um, and their total was something closer to a $1 trillion tax cut over 10 years rather than a $1.5 trillion tax cut. That was their dynamic estimate, which took into account um, not only sort of the first order effects of tax policy on federal revenue, but also how the changing economy might affect changing revenue. Now that's the Joint Committee on Taxation. The Tax Foundation had slightly different estimates. Um, we also thought that the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act would lower static revenue by about $1.5 trillion. That's the column on the left. But because the Tax Foundation model concluded that the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act would grow the long run size of the economy by 1.7%, um, which, which is larger than JCT's economic estimate. Um, the Tax Foundation model also found a larger feedback effect, a larger effect of the economy on federal revenue, and thus a lower dynamic revenue loss estimate than the JCT had. Here we, um, here the Tax Foundation estimates that the revenue cost of the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act over 10 years is more likely to be about $500 billion uh, rather than $1.5 trillion. Um, so whereas the, um, the JCT was seeing about, um, see, seeing about 25, 33% 30, of the revenue loss um, made up for by economic growth, the Tax Foundation estimates would, apply that about, would imply that about two-thirds of the revenue loss from the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act is made up for by increased economic growth. It's important to emphasize here that as far as I'm aware, there are no estimates that suggest that the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act will quote unquote pay for itself over the next 10 years solely due to economic growth. Um, certainly because pretty much everybody thinks that the bill will grow the economy Everyone thinks that the dynamic cost of the bill is likely to be lower than the static cost, which is to say that the growing size of the economy will lead to some additional federal revenue. I don't think there is any organization out there that has said that over the next 10 years, the amount of revenue that the government gains from economic growth is going to be larger than the amount of revenue that the government loses because of the initial size of the tax cuts. Um, so that is an important piece of context to keep in mind for those who are 
evaluating the, the effects of this bill. To summarize what we've talked about here today, um, the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act was a very significant piece of legislation passed by Congress that included a lot of provisions that are aimed at lowering the tax burden on people's additional labor and on their additional investment. Um, as far as everyone can tell, that's going to have a positive economic effect. And that economic effect is going to translate into a smaller revenue loss than the government would have had if there were no economic response. Um, that's about all for today. In the next four lectures, uh, we're going to be talking about specific parts of the legislation in more detail. And we're also going to be going more into detail about the field of tax economics and about the broad question of how you would design a tax code in order to maximize economic efficiency. We've got, uh, let's say, two or three minutes for questions now uh, if there are things that folks are curious about. Yes? Uh, so the, the term that you've used here is the Laffer curve. Uh, and that refers broadly to, um, the, to the relationship between tax rates and revenue that the, that, that the federal government has. Broadly speaking, if you have a zero tax rate, you've got no revenue. And if you've got a 100% tax rate, you probably also have no revenue because if you're taxing 100% of everything that everyone makes, no one's gonna work, no one's gonna invest. The Laffer curve is, is just sort of the observation that there must be some point between zero and 100 where the government is maximizing its revenue, where it's getting as much revenue as it possibly can. Um, as far as everyone knows, um, for most major categories of federal taxes, we are on the left side of the Laffer curve, um, which is, an, an economist's way of saying that if you increase the taxes, you'll gain additional revenue. If you decrease the taxes, you'll lose additional revenue. And indeed, all of the estimates that we've shown here of the revenue effects of the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act suggest that um, the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act is indeed going to lower revenue, that although it's going to have a positive economic effect, because broadly speaking, we're on the left side of the Laffer curve, um, the tax cut is not going to pay for itself. D does that answer your question? Other questions? Steve. That's entirely correct. So as, as sort of we, as, as we discussed in the lecture, um, the effect of changing the tax rate on additional work and investment is probably really what matters, um, as opposed to things that change the tax rate on work that you've done in the past or investment that you've done in the past. Um, so the provisions of the legislation that were forward-looking that affected how much people are gonna work and invest in the future, those provisions had a larger economic effect. The, in addition, as I mentioned briefly earlier, there is evidence to suggest that the amount that investment responds to tax policy is greater than the amount that labor responds to tax policy, which is to say people's decisions about how much to invest are even more affected by taxes than their decisions about how much to work. So the provisions of the bill that concentrated on investment are also probably likely to have larger economic effects than the provisions that concentrated on labor. Put those two things together, and it's pretty easy to see that the provision in the bill that, had, that, that is probably gonna have the largest economic effect uh, is going to be 100% expensing of investments, which is both a provision that only applies to, to investment that businesses are doing in the future and not investments they've made in the past, and a provision that only applies to investment and not to labor. Uh, and if we're looking at what in the bill is getting the largest bang for the buck, and what in the bill is likely to have the largest percentage of its revenue loss made up for by economic growth, it's definitely that provision. Yes, maybe our last question, if that's all right. People can come and talk to me afterward if you've got anything else, yeah. Uh, 
Well, it, it depends on the year, but. Just the ones that you have there. Sure. Uh, what's the model? So there are, um, with every economic model, different models, different assumptions you make about what the economy looks like and what the relevant facts are about the economy uh, for doing estimations. In the case of the tax foundations estimates, probably one of the biggest differences between the tax foundations models and other models is the question about how much international saving is available to fund additional investments in the United States. Um, various other models um, will look at the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act and say, this act is making it um, less expensive to invest in the United States and businesses are going to invest more, but businesses are going to be constrained by the amount of saving available to them in the United States and abroad that there might not be enough saving to fund all the investments that businesses want to make here. And they might say specifically that one, one of the things that's hindering saving is the size of the federal deficit and the amount of federal borrowing that's going to crowd out saving from the private side of the economy. Uh, the tax foundation model has a different assumption on this point. The tax foundation model makes the assumption that there actually is enough saving internationally to fund basically any level of investment in the United States that we, that, that, that we might desire. Um, and that businesses aren't going to be constrained by say the federal deficit or even by the amount of domestic saving that's available to fund investments. If that was a little bit wonky for everyone else, um, I, I, I apologize, but it's, it's a real big methodological difference between the way that the Tax Foundation estimates things and other organizations. Yeah, those, those are the two terms that you often hear used, an open economy assumption or a closed economy assumption. Um, and the Tax Foundation's assumption is, is closer to the side, of, is, is in fact an open economy assumption. That's one big difference. Other differences might have to do with how high different models think marginal tax rates are to begin with. Um, there are different methods for figuring out how high the tax rates are that apply to different, to, to additional work and additional investment. Our conclusion has, has generally been that those taxes are indeed pretty high and other models make some assumptions that lead to thinking that those marginal tax rates are lower than the tax foundation's models thinks, that, thinks they are. The upshot of this is that um, if you start from a high tax rate, you're more likely to see economic growth in lowering it than if you start from a lower tax rate. There's more bang for your buck in going from 60 to 40 than there is from going from 40 to 20. So that's another big difference in methodology that's leading to the results being different. Um, the, the four times thing, I'm, I'm not totally sure which line you were looking at. I'll say that the, uh, in terms of long run estimates, Tax Foundation estimates that the, that the bill is going to uh, grow the economy by 1.7% in the long run. The next highest estimate is from the folks at the Warden School at Penn. They've got a figure of 1.6% long run economic growth for their high end estimate. Um, that's a great question. Long run means whenever the economy has finished adjusting to the effects of tax changes. No one's entirely sure about how long it takes. How long it takes for people to change their labor decisions in response to changes in tax rates. How long it takes businesses to change their investment decisions in response to tax rates. Um, so um, I, I, I would say that um, the Tax Foundation's um, estimates for whenever that long run happens are not really all that different from the high-end estimates from, say, the folks at University of Pennsylvania. Um, maybe one final question if anyone has one. Well, great. We'll wrap up for today and hope to see you all here next week as we talk about what wasn't in the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act and um, what sort of the next steps in federal tax policy might look like going forward. Thanks.